Monsieur, Madame, uh, euh, je voudrais euh, vous euh, accueillir à nom euh, de les euh, trois partenaires que on, nous avons ici. C'est un plaisir d'être euh, euh, à Marrakech une autre fois. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome on behalf of the three partners of uh, this event. Uh, we are a partnership of uh, IFOAM, Organic uh, International, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture of the Delegation of Madagascar, and the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, the University of California is already emerged by ourselves. Uh, we are a merge of the uh, University of Santa Barbara, the Orfalea Center, who is focusing in climate justice, and of uh, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, and we are focusing on health and nutrition issues. So um, this is going to be, uh, you know, a partnership and a very interesting panel. We would like to uh, thank uh, our colleagues from FAO uh, to agree uh, to moderate uh, our panel. Um, and I would like uh, to uh, introduce our moderator, Mr. Michael Haig, who is the FAO representative of Morocco and who has uh, experience in dealing with all these aspects that we are going to discuss today. So uh, the objectives of the, uh, our event uh, will be, to, uh, we will try to have uh, a forum uh, to discuss and explore uh, the best practices for biodiversity conservation, for health and nutrition through the promotion of sustainable and healthy food systems and diets. Um, the, this event will discuss the uh, agroecological resilience and the adopt adoption of a climate justice approach in the context of climate change and the SDGs agendas. Uh, some of the objectives that we have with this event is to explore how sustainable food systems and agroecological strategies can lead to shared benefits for climate resilience, biodiversity conservation, food and nutrition security, health, and protection of uh, human rights. We would like uh, to showcase a uh, very interesting uh, case studies from uh, Madagascar and the great potential that the country has for agroecology and food security. And finally, uh, we would like, uh, you know, with uh, um, after the discussion to have some points, uh, key points uh, to make recommendations on what governments, NGOs, the academia and the UN can do to support agroecology as a climate resilience production model and to promote the adoption of a human rights and climate justice approach within the climate change agenda. So without more delay, um, uh, I pass the word to our moderator today, Mr. Uh, Michael Haig. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you in turn to Marrakesh and to the uh, side event on sustainable food systems and agroecological resilience for biodiversity and health. I'm uh, delighted to be associated with uh, such a distinguished uh, uh, panelists who will, uh, who will make a series of presentations, six to be exact. We have until um, uh, 6.15 p.m. to leave the room. We will have uh, time for approximately eight minutes each, but if we want to leave uh, some time for q and I would invite uh, panelists to economize to the extent mm -hmm. possible. Um, it is therefore my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderates, our mod to, to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. Andre Liu is president of Organics International. Uh, Mrs. Michelle Andriamazo, uh, head of department uh, for Environment and Climate Change, Ministry of Agriculture of Madagascar, Mino Nandriana Rako Tonans Drasana, agronomist within the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock of Madagascar. Uh, I'm also happy to introduce Dr. Christina Tirado van der Fallen from UCLA, Institute of Environment and Sustainability and Chair of the International Union for Nutritional Sciences, Task Force on Climate Change and Nutrition. I'm also happy to introduce Ms. Hindu Omaru Ibrahim from Chad, coordinator of the Indigenous People of Africa, and Benjamin uh, Schachter, Human Rights Officer, Climate Change and Environment Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and he's the head of OHCHR's delegation to COP22. Please give him a round of applause. 
we we can we can the cause of food security requires awareness raising i'm sure you might be thinking that you're preaching to the converted but i hope that everybody will go out from here uh making a commitment to engage their country representatives here to make sure that negotiators on agriculture will negotiators in general will have agriculture at, and food security at the heart of the negotiations coming out of cop 22. it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first panelist mr andre Liu, president of ifoam or organics international Andre is the International Federation of Organic Farmers, has long experience in the establishment of sustainable food systems through organic agriculture. I hope that he can share with us his experience on how agroecological strategies such as organic agriculture could lead to shared benefits for climate resilience, adaptation, and mitigation. Andre, you have the floor. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here today because this is actually one of the very important segments of the COP. It's an agricultural day, but we still don't have the word agriculture put in any text. I want to set the scene because we've got different sustainable or regenerative production systems here. Let's make sure. And I just want to explain the urgency of what we're doing. This year, 2016, for the first time in more than 600,000 years, we reached 400 parts per million. The, if by some miracle we captured at that, which we won't, we will be between 3.4 to 5 degrees warmer. The consensus amongst a lot of scientists is that if we reach 450 parts per million, we cross the threshold for catastrophic climate change. At the moment, the only good thing we can say is that the amount of emissions, emissions has leveled off to, at this stage, two parts per million per year. And really, it's, under the Paris Agreement, it's not, look, there's no, start of reducing emissions to 2030. If we continue at this rate, we reach the tipping point in the year 2041. We have 50, so 25 years. And at two parts per million, that's 50 million extra parts. The big issue is this, if we stay at 400 parts per million, the greenhouse gases we're putting out now and we've got in is the cumulative effect. Well, we won't really start to feel those until 2050 up to 2100. The real issue we need to get across is this, because a lot of people say, oh, look, we're two degrees warmer. That means winters are gonna be a bit nicer and we'll just turn the air conditioners up a bit in summer to cope for the two degrees. What people have to understand is We've heated the world up now to 1.25, one and a quarter degrees over the industrial revolution levels. To heat up the world, that requires a lot of energy. It's the equivalent of thousands of atomic bombs worth of energy heating up and fueling our weather system. So that's why we're seeing longer droughts, more severe droughts. We're seeing more flooding rains. We're seeing hurricanes and cyclones, bigger than we've ever had before. And in winter, you're seeing snowstorms and blizzards because all these storms now have extra energy. According to NASA, what was once every 30 years events are now one in five, and that is contracting. So what we need to do is not just stop emissions. We have to take them out of the atmosphere. If we just stop emissions, we will still go into catastrophic climate change. I want to show you this model. It's just come out this month. The red line is where we're tracking at the moment into catastrophic climate change. The lowest line scenario is if we could keep it at two degrees, which is the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was to um, 
keep it at two, but hopefully at one point at one and a half degrees. The fact is, we're already one and a quarter degrees. We're a quarter of a degree off that, and every scientist is saying we've missed 1.5. Maybe we can keep it at two. But the reason why Paris decided to go lower than two is because last year the evidence came out that if we go to two degrees, the sea level rises will take out countries like Bangladesh and East Bengal. There's 100 million people there, Calcutta and Dhaka and all those areas. It'll take out the Netherlands. I don't, don't know if they can continue by building enough dikes in you know, Amsterdam. It will take out most, a lot of the east coast of the USA. Think about New York, New Orleans, Miami. Miami's already having trouble in king tides. Then if we want to go over to Asia and we look at the mega cities like Bangkok, 30 million people, Seoul in Korea, 30 million people, Manila, 30 million people, Jakarta, 30 million people. We're talking about having hundreds of millions of climate refugees. At the moment, we can't cope with 2 million because of uh, Syria and the drought in Southern and Sub-Saharan Africa. How do we cope with something that is actually going to be 200 times worse. That's not the world we want to live in. The, I think probably one of the most important things that came out in Paris, it's the world's best kept secret, but on December 1, the French government launched this initiative, four for 1,000. And what that is, is, is that if we can take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and put it in the soil as organic matter, and have an increase of four parts per thousand per year in agricultural soils, we can basically stop climate change and start to reverse it. It's, there's now around 30 countries have signed on. The um, FAO signed on, EFUD, uh, the Global Environment Fund, the CGIR, many NGOs actually close to a billion dollars was put on the table that day to, for this initiative. So this is a serious initiative. I think what we need to really get across here is that you know, our first task is to stabilize emissions and draw them down. And we're at a point now where we've got to use every tool in the toolbox. If you're going to say, well, we just go to renewables, how does that take us down from, from 400 parts per million back to um, you know, industrial levels. It won't. The analogy we use there, if you've got a boat that is sinking, you've got water coming and you've got to do two things. You've got to plug the leak and you have to bail out the water. If you just plug the leak and leave the water in, you'll sink. If you don't plug the leak and just bail it out, you'll sink. At the moment, the only thing we've done is stabilise the hole where the leak is coming out, we're doing neither. So, and if the scientists are right, we've got 25 years to get it right and turn it around. So, what I want to show here is just agriculture. This four for thousand by increasing soil organic matter. And there's some figures there, but basically, without me wasting time on the mass, we have to take around 15 per year out of the atmosphere just to stabilize. One of the words we're using now to describe different agricultural systems that can regenerate soil organic matter, we're calling them regenerative. So in my case, it's regenerative organic agriculture, there's agroecology, there's holistic land management. There are many forms of regenerative agriculture. Now is not the time to debate which is the best, now is the time to start putting it in. So just to give examples here, this is a peer-reviewed study of Mediterranean climates and what they found in, and also there's another one in North America, another one in Egypt, they all came up with around three and a half thousand kilos of CO2 per year per hectare in the soil. If we extrapolate that by the FAO figures for agricultural land, they will sequester 17 gigatons. That's two gigatons over what we need to do. The, but with any sort of average, you have outliers that do better. We have good data where by adding compost, we can 
take that up to eight tonnes per year. We extrapolate that, 40 gigatons. And then what I want to also end on is here that 68% of the world's agricultural lands are rangelands, are grazing lands. And this is where, by changing grazing to holistic management, we cannot, we, we will increase the amount of stock we keep and we increase the amount of carbon. This is one of the studies, peer reviewed studies in degraded areas in Arizona that they turned around and they sequestered the equivalent. If we extrapolated it just by arid grazing areas in the world of 98 gigatons per year. So I really want to end on that because what I want to say is that we do have the evidence by scaling up the right forms of farming and we have many, many ones, you'll hear, hear different examples from the speakers. We can turn agriculture from being a problem to one of the most important solutions for our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for giving us a lucid image of not only the vulnerability of our planet to climate change. Perhaps today, more than any other day before, we need to, reminded, to be reminded of that fact, but also for pointing out the important role that organic agriculture and agriculture in general can be the solution to the problem of greenhouse emissions. And that following these practices will not only be a, um, a, the economically wise decision to do it, but the cost of action into introducing the methodologies that Andre had presented is far cheaper. I would like next to introduce uh, Dr. Tirado van, Perpen van der Palen, who organized with WHO and the CBD Secretariat a session on sustainable food systems, biodiversity and health at the WHO Ministerial Conference on Climate Change and Health this summer in Paris. I hope that she will be able to share with us the main issues discussed and the opportunities that were identified advanced uh, to climate change agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you Yeah, thank you. We are um, we are uh, sharing today with you um, some uh, discussions that we have in the Ministerial Conference of Climate Change and Health in Paris this summer. And um, uh, we, uh, we have these messages prepared with WHO, with the Convention of Biological Diversity and with UNEP and with uh, our group uh, uh, of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences, the Tax Force of uh, Climate and Nutrition. So we were first uh, focusing uh, on the challenges that uh, we have to face today. And uh, despite of the obvious challenge uh, and environmental, uh, of climate and environmental change uh, on the impacts and in undernutrition, we have to, uh, we have to consider that by uh, 2080, we may have from one to three mil billion uh, more people that will experience water scarcity, and from two to 200 to 600 million people more that will experience hunger. Uh, at the same time, uh, today, we know that we have around 800 million people that are food insecure, but, but the challenge that we have is that this is uh, 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 global malnutrition uh, that w has been uh, many times called double burden of malnutrition. It could be even called triple burden of malnutrition. We have 2 billion people that suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. And at the uh, same time, we have uh, uh, almost uh, 2.1 billion of people that are o obese or, ob uh, or overweight. And this is increasing uh, nonstop since the 80s. So, um, the situation that we have is that with the current uh, industrial food systems, we have uh, got what we call uh, the nutrition transition. Uh, industrial monoculture it has been promoting uh, energy-rich but nutrient-poor diets, and, uh, and at the same time, the uh, use of pesticides use has uh, chronically exposed uh, our populations to uh, um, 
future uh, problems that you don't see them today, but you know, the cancer rates related to, uh, to pesticide use or endocrine disruption effects that we don't know and we don't understand very well right now, or a reproductive dysfunction that we are starting to see uh, young girls uh, getting uh, you know, uh, um, to the videos very early. All these problems that now uh, we still, we are struggling to understand in different aspects of health, why they are coming from, uh, they, they are pointing that they may come from uh, certain uses of pesticides and certain uses of uh, plastics and plastifiers. So, the, and this is something that uh, we, we are uh, trying to understand. But bottom line, uh, looking into the NCDs, it's non-communicable diseases. The ones that are related to diet, like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, or cancer, are uh, causing right now 63% of the global deaths, okay? So it has been estimated that in the next 20 years, and in part due to climate change and a reduced production of fruits and vegetables and increasing prices of them, we may have the cause of non-communicable diseases to the health sector is going to rise to up to 30 trillion, which is 48% of the global GDP in 2010. That's the last estimate uh, from the model, modelings of the impacts of climate change on the produ production of foods, uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. So this is a big bill. Um, and uh, um, at the same time, we are seeing uh, situations and problems in the loss, loss of agrobiodiversity. If uh, from the 250,000 uh, identified plant species uh, we have been using for uh, agriculture and uh, historically for food uses, only 7,000, right now uh, we have only 12 crops that together with five animal species provide 75% of the world's food today. This is extremely dangerous. We are playing, uh, you know, a, a, a time bomb like uh, if, if we don't conserve the existing uh, species uh, that are nourishing people. So we are having systems that are more vulnerable to pests and disease. Uh, we are seeing decline in pollinator species. We are seeing a decline on uh, soil productivity. And in, in a way, we are losing resilience, uh, ecosystems and human resilience. So this is um, a, a book that I recommend you to read. It's a huge report that has been prepared by the CBD, the Convention of Biological Diversity and WHO, where we have put all together all these linkages between biodiversity and human health. And one of the main issues was the loss of agrobiodiversity. And we know, and uh, uh, Andre has mentioned this, that feeding the world sustainably and promoting nutrition and health will be one of the main challenges of uh, our world. Uh, so, um, the solutions that we are trying will be focusing in sustainable food production and consumption. From the side of uh, production, uh, nutrition-sensitive um, adaptation in the agriculture sector or nutrition-sensitive climate smart agriculture uh, may increase diet diversity and quality while reducing greenhouse emissions. So, it's a, it's a way of setting up these projects in a way that the ultimate goal of these uh, uh, um, climate smart agriculture projects, the ultimate goal should be feeding the people or, you know, like promoting health, feeding the people and uh, um, that they are serving to. Uh, and this could be done, you know, through urban and peri-urban uh, conservation agriculture, agroecology and agroforestry, and our colleagues from uh, Madagascar will discuss this in length. Uh, you know, integrating fish farming with sustainable rice intensification, promoting uh, that we keep our traditional species and breeds that are uh, resistant. You know, it's like all the breeds from the uh, Pyrenees in Spain, where I am from, that were super resistant, they don't use them because they don't produce, they consider that they did not produce enough milk. Well, you know, all this is something that has to be put in context and, and, and to keep these breeds and not just to lose them. Um, then another way is the consumption path, okay? We are now promoting through the, side, uh, through the health side uh, um, sustainable diets that according to FAO have been uh, defined like low uh, uh, diets of low environmental impacts, protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, 
while optimizing natural and human resources. The definition of FAO is outstanding. It was great. It was even looking at the knowledge, looking at the knowledge of the indigenous people. It's a, to me, so far, is the best definition so far that we have. But we have to put this in practice because it's very, um, it's very broad. So we are trying to go down to earth. What do we have with dietary guidelines in our countries? And um, uh, uh, I don't know if you recall that uh, now it's uh, almost six years ago, UNEP for the first time say very clearly that uh, uh, as global population in, uh, increases, diets rich in meat and dairy products are unsustainable. They, uh, they were mentioning this in the context of countries where they are overeating meal, uh, uh, meat and, you know, in industrialized countries that they are not having problems of undernutrition. This is, has to be put in the right context. But once that we are there, uh, for the rest, what accounts for the rest, uh, if we don't listen to this, and many groups have not been listening to them for the last six years, it's only now that they start the other UN organizations to help to pass this message and to practicalize this message with the countries, which is not easy. I understand perfectly that. But uh, for uh, the rest and for the consumer point of view, in rich countries where we overeat meat, this is a question of climate justice, of e equity, and it's an ethical issue, you know, the, uh, or the amount of meat and animal products that we are eating. But we didn't know that, okay? We did not realize. But it's time. Now it's time. Uh, now it's open to talk about this. and. For example, I, have, I want to share a very good example of how there are drivers that can change this. Uh, back in 2009, Sweden started to uh, produce and to include some um, environmental sustainability criteria in the um, uh, food-based dietary guidelines. They were based in a report that is very interesting from the Nordic countries that have uh, um, established a, a report on dietary guidelines recommendations. Um, um, and, you know, the, the recommendations are so simple and logical that nobody could, you know, say that this is not what the doctors or, you know, the, the health sector is recommending. It's exactly the same. You know, like eat less meat and reduce the portion size, eat locally produced and grass-fed animals, or when we go into fish, you know, to choose seafood, with sustainable eco-labels, or uh, choose fruits and vegetables that are seasonal and locally produced, and, you know, and other staples that are locally grown, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, fats that are locally grown as well, and, uh, and water. I mean, why we have to drink bottled water? You know, it's so logical that uh, uh, everybody will agree with them, and they have been the pioneers. But so far in the world, only four countries have sustainability criteria in the dietary guidelines. It's Sweden, it's Brazil, it's Qatar, and I think the last one is uh, Netherlands. And Germany is coming up, arriving there. But you know, so far, so we only have four. So this is a challenge, and, uh, and we would like, um, it's not moving. Okay, and we would like to work on that. Uh, let me see, they went too fast. And uh, in the, in the, um, in the WHO conference on climate change and health, we agreed that if we were just uh, countries, if we were just meeting, trying to meet the very simple, uh, logical WHO dietary guidelines, we may reduce uh, emissions by far uh, in some countries up to 30% of what they have, just for by meeting WHO dietary guidelines that are uh, promoting to eat more fruits and vegetables and reduce the amount of meat that we are eating. And now it's a question of optimizing diets for nutritional health, for emissions, for biodiversity. This is a challenge, it's new. And of course, by uh, consumer acceptability, because it's not always straightforward. And um, at the same time, uh, we would like to see how we can introduce these dietary patterns and different ways uh, of mitigating drivers that can help to mitigate uh, mitigation and biodiversity conservation and health components in the NAPs, in the NAMAS, and in the NDCs, and because this definitely will help us uh, to, uh, to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals in a more integrated way. And this is the last uh, 
uh, uh, slide that I wanted to show you of the deconstruction of the SDGs, how we need to um, them in order to get an, uh, uh, health and nutrition outcomes. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for reminding us that to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 3 on health and nutrition, we need to be uh, aware of the additional uh, food production that is needed by 2050, 60 to 70 percent more to meet the food needs of our planet. But we must do it. We must do it in a way that uh, not only meets the challenges of a climate in, uh, of a changing climate, but also in respecting biodiversity and ecosystems and also for reminding us that as, as consumers, the choices we make at the supermarket can also play an important role in encouraging people who respect biodiversity and ecosystems and their productions. Thank you for that uh, presentation, Christina, very uh, insightful. Uh, now I have the pleasure to present Mrs. Michelle Andrea Mazo, Head of the Department of Environment and Climate Change at the Ministry of Agriculture of Madagascar. I'd like to ask her to please share her experience of Madagascar in promoting sustainable food system and improving food security and nutrition through agroecology and agroforestry. Please welcome Mrs. Andrea Mazu. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to share with you today the experience of Madagascar about uh, climate smart agriculture, in particular agroforestry, uh, related to the agriculture sector. Uh, in fact, our department is a uh, charge of uh, environment impact assessment, but uh, it is also charge of uh, of uh, all uh, environment issue and uh, cross cutting uh, issue about agriculture and environment. So, uh, um, I divided my presentation into three parts. The first, the first part is about the country agriculture overview and food security issue, context and challenges. The second part is about impact of climate change of uh, in agriculture sector and the link to the food security. And the last part is about the response uh, about agroecology and uh, agroforestry. Hmm. 
Hoşçakalın. Sorry, I think we have to rest.